Hello and welcome to today's second webinar. Um, thank you very much for taking time out and being here again at two o'clock. And my name is Ayong. I am the marketing and educational seminar coordinator here at Neo Biotech. And this is me right here. So today's subject, um, so today's topic is how do you like your implant stability with Dr. Spencer Park? And here is, I will go over some agenda. Um, it's very simple. So um, I will, yeah, so first one um, is I already introduced the topic and then the presenter. And the second one will be, I will announce a special promotion at the end of the webinar. And the third one, I will also um, announce about the upcoming and previous webinars. And lastly, um, I will go over how to receive your C credits. And also, we are strongly recommended to use the chat box during this webinar um, if you have any technical issues and other than the topic. And we will have a QA session at the end. So please submit your questions through this QA box right here. And Dr. Park will answer your questions. So um, let's, let's have Dr. Park to start um, this afternoon's webinar. Good afternoon, Dr. Park. How are you doing? Hello, how are you? I'm doing great. How are I'm you? doing great. How are you? Good, very nice. Let me start my video screen. Ayon, could you allow? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ha Young, for your great introduction. Uh, hello, doctors, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the Biotech webinar, and then I hope everybody's doing okay and fine, and then stay healthy and stay peace, stay in peace as much as possible. So let me start our the webinar lecture, and then let me share my the slide all together. Right, today we're going to discuss about uh, implant stability. So my title is, how do you like your implant stability? Well, the main reason that I picked this title is depend on the individual, somebody using the torque and then different number of the torque, somebody using the different machine ISQ or any check or even perio test. But there's not really a general consensus and based on the scientific debate, uh, evidence on what we need to do in, in, in the clinical situation. So today I'd like to discuss with you about those implant stability. So I used to teach in UCLA prosthetic department and then I recently uh, left the school and now I'm working for the Neo Biotech and then also Ray America as a consultant and, and also the director of the GAO. So when to load a dental implant? That is the most important question for the clinician like us, right? The determining factor of the dental implant loading timing is first one is what patient need. And patient one, compliance, occlusion, medical dental history, of course. And also soft tissue wise, make sure the soft tissue around the implant is healed and maturated. And also hard tissue such as a bone, so the bone must be healed and also remodeling and also integration done properly. And also in clinic, the implant stability is also a great issue for us to determine the implant, the, the loading. That those implant stability, we're going to discuss about it today. Based on the JPD, their definition of the implant stability is the characteristic endure the force on the implant and also they pointed out that primary stability, their definition is a mechanical stabilization. Now let's look at the AAID, their definition. Their definition is an absence of clinically detectable implant mobility. Well, we are talking about the implant stability, but the definition itself, they talk about the implant mobility. Well, the truth is to measure the implant stability, that means we have to measure the implant mobility. 
In other words, high implant stability means that low implant mobility. High implant mobility means that low implant stability. So we are measuring the same thing, but we're looking at the opposite directions. So let's talk about the implant mobility or stability together. In clinical situation, we can face those mobility like vertical mobility and also those lateral mobility and also those tilting mobility and also those rotational mobility. So my humble definition for the implant stability is the absence of the fixture mobility under the physiological force from mastication. In other words, once I place those implant and I put some crown on it and then patient begin to chew, but during the chewing, I do not want to see any mobility such as those, right? So I want to achieve those the stability and I want to maintain those stability, that's the goal. Let's look at the, our conventional, the stability, the graph. It's a very famous one. As you can see over here, we start with the primary stability that determined by the osteoclast activities, right? We start with a high number, but we are decreasing. But also we have a secondary stability over here that was determined pretty much by the osteoblast activity and the bone maturation, bone remodeling. Those two going to end up total stability as you can see. So when I was resident, because we have those deep, whether osteoclast activities uh, increased, but osteoblast activities didn't follow yet, then those two to five, two to six weeks is we call implant stability deep, and also we call dangerous zone. So my professor told me that do not touch your implant during that time. So in other words, stability deep means that actually mobility bump, right? Then why we have those stability deep? There's a many reasons, of course, but one of the reasons that I want to point out is this. Conventional and also pre-tapping method. Here, so far, we are using the countersink or conventional ways. As you can see over here, those area basically stress is concentrated. Once those bone under the lot of stress, they're gonna call the osteoclast to relieve those stress. Those stress concentration cause a high possibility of the rapid and large amount of osteolytic bone remodeling due to the higher stress. So if we do the pre-tapping or CMA fixation concept with the new biotech, then we can minimize those problems as much as possible. And also from the osteoblast point of view, as you can see over here, all those areas, osteoblast need to build up again and maturate it. So, Excessive amount of the bone damage or loss resulting large amount of the new bone formation and maturation. So if we do the pre-tapping situation, the method, then we can minimize those new bone the formation maturation. So hopefully the healing time going to be shortened. Well, that is about uh, just um, the why we have those uh, stability dip depend on the base on the osteoblast and osteoclast activity. Of course, there is an infection and loading, overloading the other the factors too. So in terms of implant stability measuring method, based on 2010 article, we have some invasive method and we have a non-invasive method. First one is tensional. We push the implant laterally until it fractured out, or push out. Or we'll place the implant and then push out the implant while we'll pull out, and where we can reverse to apply the reverse torque until it's fractured off, right? And also we can use a band that is a value of actual micro motion. I'm going to explain to you later. Now, non-invasive way or non-destructive method, we have a sound. So when I was a resident, my professor told me that using the intraoral mirror tail and then tapping those implant healing over time, then I can hear the sound. And based on the sound, I can say my implant is good or bad. But to be honest with you, I even cannot tell my watermelon is good or bad by tapping it. But some doctors can use a sound. And insertion torque, right? That is another non-invasive. And also, if we apply the small amount of the reverse torque, that is also can be non-invasive way. And also, we have a damping capacity analysis. And also, we have a resonant frequency analysis method too. So let's go a little bit more detail. So let me share one of the experimental way to using those implant stability measuring. First one is pushing out. So stability means the mobility, measuring the mobility means the degree of the osseo integration. That means about the break point in terms of those in vitro, in vivo method. So 
So I created those mini implants, 0.6 millimeter diameter, and then I placed those in the mouse femur right here. This is a clinical pictures, and those are x-ray. So once, so one to six weeks later, then I cut those the bone, and then I pushing out this implant. When I'm pushing out one point, there's gonna be no more forces needed. That means fracture point. Then I can tell the strength, the bonding strength between this implant and then bone. So this is how we are using the pushing out test to measure the implant stability or the degree of bone integration. So over here, as you can see, motion to surface and SLA surface three to four weeks, definitely we can see higher pushing out value in SLA surface. So again, rough surface is better than smooth surface, as we all know. And this is a diagram of the value of the actual micromotion over here. We have a little implant here, and then we have a hammer over here. And then that implant, there is a laser beam on top of the implant, next to the implant, and once the hammer is bang the implant, the implant is beginning to move, and then it's going to the record it, how those implants move. So this is, we consider this is one of the most accurate way to measure the actual implant movement. However, we cannot use this method for the intra orally. Only the in vitro is possible for this case. Then let's talk about the non-invasive method for clinic. The method that we can use in our clinic. First one is uh, insertion trope. Well, so in this case, as you can see, I'm using the digital insertion torque measuring motion over here. So it measures the highest, the number highest torque the, uh, of those uh, implant. Right? So insertion torque and seating torque or final torque, all those things, slightly different terminology definition. However, in this say we are using those insertion torque as the highest the number of the torque during the implant insertion. Well, in terms of the torque, there was a quite a controversy about the compression necrosis, as we all know. 2009, Michigan group published the one case report that the implant was, a lot, the bone around the implant was gone in two to four weeks without any loading or infection. And they pointed out the possibility of the compression necrosis. But after then, all those all the company and then implantologists, they are worried about it. And then we always talk to that no more than 50 Newton, no more than 40 Newton centimeter, right? Because we are worried about the uh, overtrope while compression necrosis. However, there's another group, 2011, they published that they shows that even high trope, they don't see any uh, compression necrosis as a bonus around those implants. So still they are quite a debating whether we actually there is a compression necrosis or not. However, the way I look at it is this. I published this is a 2000, I, uh, on the, I presented this is 2016 IADL. And then if we are pushing the hard bone, then more than 40 Newton centimeter in dense bone, like polycobone hard bone layer, possible compression necrosis or excessive bone remodeling. Because if we push the hard bone, they are going to call the osteoclast and then they are going to activate really quickly. However, if we get those the torque from the soft bone area by compaction, not by compression, oh, and then I believe we have a less osteoclast activity that going to uh, end it up that a little bit more allowable and the forgivable torque over there. So over torque, the number is all important. However, also the location where you get those torque is also important. So for example, over here, let's look at the center one. This is my exper experiment and I'm using the 1.5 millimeter cortical layer sample. So I placed a four by 10 implant. But as you can see over here, I control that the drilling size or certain size from 3.0 to 4.0. And as you can see over here, even though I increase the osteotomy size from 3.0 to 3.5, the torque itself is very similar. However, the when I did the tapping, then the torque is the decrease significantly. Whenever you have a hard bone layer, or dense bone, or cortical bone layer, keep in mind, your tapping procedure basically determines that the torque. So I just want to point out the importance of the pre-tapping in terms of the control your uh, implant torque, insertion torque. So now let me share my friend's case, right? He placed those implant and then from the very beginning, him 
uh, aimed for the immediate loading. So what he told me that he placed those two implants and then when he placed it, it was about 60 newton, 50 newton. So what he did is he counterclockwise a couple of times, back and forth, back and forth, and it ended up putting the implant. Final torque is about 40 newton, right? That's what he claimed. So those two implants is 40 newtons. Uh, and then about 10 days, about 10 days later, patient complained a little bit of the dull pain. And about another 10 days later, you can see significant bone loss and about a month. And then you can see the huge bone is gone. So I believe this is one of the very typical uh, X-ray radiograph image of the compression necrosis, right? And how about this? So in this case, also my friend placed this implant and then when uh, about uh, two weeks later, you can see the big bone loss around it here. So maybe this is possibly overloading or occlusion issue. But one thing that I want to point out is this. Let's look at the bone density. This is a root and this is a dentin and this is a bone. As you can see, based on the PA, those two areas have very same brightness. That means the bone over here is quite dense, right? So that is one thing that I want to point out. So whenever you're dealing with a hard bone, be careful. And then we have a high possibility of the compression necrosis or lapid bone remodeling by giving a stress on our hard bone areas, right? This is another example, right? Bone is quite dense and then the dentist placed the implant and then you can see even before the loading, you see a lot of the bone lo loose around those implants, right? I think. So, now let's move on for the resonant frequency analysis. So we are using the Ostel or Penguin. So it sounds very complicated and fancy, resonant frequency analysis. But basically, this machine give a, put some pack, smart pack on top of the implant. And then this machine give a magnetic force. Once the magnetic force hit those uh, implant and implant it vibrate, the vibrating implant creates some frequency and this machine captures the frequency and convert into the their value of the ISQ, implant stability values right here. So let me share those video clip. So as you can see, when I hit my wine glass with a spoon, you can hear the sound, but actually, by hitting my wine glass, I create the vibration of my wine glass, and then when my wine glass is vibrated, and then it creates the frequencies, right? That is how those resonant frequency analysis works. So basically, we measure how much it vibrates. If it vibrates too much, maybe low stability. If it vibrates little, then high uh, stability. So this I tried to mimic the clinical situation. In this case, implant place in a not a great way. So as you can see, half of implant is in the bone, as you can see over here, the other half is on the air. So in other words, this implant has a vertical defect. Now I want to show you how those vertical defects affect the implant uh, stability value using the hostel. As you can see, even the number is a 60 or on average is 63, quite a high numbers. However, that number means anything because clinically, as you can see, there's no stability whatsoever. So I ask myself, what is going on over here? Well, this is my simple answer, right? Let me share with you. So as you can see, I adding the Play-Doh on the wine glass and then just little vertical Play-Doh actually interfering the vibrating. Without increase the stability, I did not hold my wine glass harder, simply adding some little bit of the Play-Doh 
interfering vibrating and then it's going to be interfering the frequency. Since the frequency is changed and then the Oster RFA value has a first positive one. So that is one thing that I wanted to remember that bone defect a pattern if the influence was the outcome of the stability measuring value. And also this one I tried to mimic, I tried to test that the effect of the bone graft on the RFA. So as you can see over here, in clinical situation, we extract the tooth and then there's a lot of graft, the empty area, and we put some bone graft over here. So here I create those situation. So let me share. So on the cow rib, and then I do the, intentionally I did the over osteotomy, as you can see over here, right? And then I place the implant. And then it was very little, so the torque is almost zero. And then I measure the RFA, it's a 28. So, so far, low torque value, low RFA, no problem. And I put in some bone graft around here and then clean up. Right? And then put the smart peg again and then measure it. Now you can see it jumped 28 to 48 or 43. So we know that just adding the bone graft is not really significantly increased the actual stability of the implant. However, those of wet bone graft stay on the implant surface, they're going to interfere in the vibrating of the implant and also it's going to change the uh, interfering the proper uh, frequency producing and it ended up the first positive one. So those two things, I want to point it out then. So let's talk about the period test. Then what is a damping capacity analysis? Damping capacity analysis is like when you have a target, then once you hit it, if your target is very strong, then the knockback will be very little. So once it hit it, your target is gonna come back very quickly. However, if your target is not really strong, once you hit it, it's going to push back and then it's gonna come back. So basically damping capacity analysis is measuring the returning time once you Hit it, those hitting those are target areas, right? And then they using the they own the value is a period test value, and then the lower the better. Minus is good, and higher number is bad. That's how they uh, set up it, right? However, the problem of those period tests is rejected by the patient. Let me share those video clip. Six point one. So as you can see, to measure the one time, this machine needs to hit the implant 60 times, 16 times. And also the focusion force is 1.2 Newton. So many patients complained of pain and it was quite scary, right? And then if you want to measure the three times, then you have to hit the implant like 48 times. It's a quite a burden to patients and doctors too. However, this machine, if we control the environment very clearly, right, and then the control very well, then it's a great motion to measure the implant stability because it actually hitting the implant and it actually measures how those implants move by measuring the time, right. So as a researcher, it has a great value. However, in terms of the clinician and patient, it was rejected. But Neo Biotech about five years ago, they rekindle, candle, revisit those damping, damping corpus analysis. So they uh, up upgraded quite a bit. So the focus on force is decreased 30% and also the focus on time number is two to six times. If the number is more than 60 IST, then it's they hit the six time. If it's less than 60, it hit only two times. And it also has a built-in protective function. So if the implant is dislodged, then, then it's gonna give you the warning sign. So for example, let me share this video clip. So as you can see over here, you can see those red number that is basically warning and also those the first video clip you can see that if the number is 59, it hit only uh, two times. So what I did is about 2015, I get all those machine and then try to find out what machine is reliable, right? 
In other words, I try to validate the stability value with the four motion as much as possible. So I'm using the torque and I'm using the residual frequency analysis and I'm using the damping capacitance analysis using the period test and any check. So this is how I did at the time. So I measured the four times and also spell while well, RFA motion, I measure the buccal lingual major distal, right? So this is actually what I did, right? So the answer is for make it briefly, then I can explain to you that I try to find out the correlation between OSTEL ISQ and then insertion torque. But unfortunately, there is no strong correlations. Right? However, what I found is this. What I found is if the insertion torque is more than 15 Newton centimeter, then 96% of all those sample has a more than 60 ISQ. And also, if the sample has a more than 60 ISQ, then 83% of those uh, implant uh, has a 15 Newton centimeter insertion torque. So, you know, easy way, if you, I have a hostel, the samples, and then I have a torque, 15 Newton centimeter, and then when I look at both of them, as you can see, torque has a more common area. So when I compare those two, and if I need to pick up only one machine, then using the hostel is more... Okay, hold on, sorry about that. All right, now let me move on. So now let me uh, show that the period test value and the insertion to the relation those two, right? And then uh, again, there's a very little correlation, however, 91% and then also 96% of the, the uh, threshold uh, area. So in a simple way, as you can see over here, period test value, those sample, if that is less than five, PTV and then torque is more than 15 Newton centimeter. As you can see, period test is a more common area. Of course, this data is based on the in vitro, not clinical data. Now let's look at the any check and the insertion torque data. Right? It has a little bit higher correlation and also it shows that 94% of all sample greater than 15 Newton centimeter has a 60 IST. So in other words, as you can see over here, any check and torque more than 15 Newton centimeters is very close to each other's, right? So overall, with those four different machines, I wish I can find out the one machine that is going to satisfy those common areas. However, no single golden device to satisfy all those one. However, what I found is if I'm using the two value at the same time, then I can increase the validation the validity significantly. So for example, I'm using the minimum threshold theory and then if uh, my sample is a 15 Newton centimeter insertion torque and then 60 IST energy value, and then if my sample satisfies those, satisfy those two conditions and then the minimum of insertion torque is 18, average is 44 Newton centimeters, and then average ISQ is 75, and then period test is 0.5, and it's a is 68. The bottom line is, if we combine those two values at the same time, it was much safer. But the most important one is, I can tell you, is that the insertion torque. Right? So again, implant mobility and stability, those lateral movement and all those mobility-wise, and then any check, what well, the other machine can measure those lateral mobility. However, the torque itself is cannot be measured. That is very important for us to remember it. Not only the any check, but also this one give you the, again, the graph between the correlation between the insertion torque and OSTEL. So over here, as you can see, let's say your OSTEL value is about 55, right? 55 over here. But the insertion torque value can be 5, 10, or even 15 over here, as you can see. So clearly it's going to tell you that OSTEL will not tell you that the torque value, there's no correlation, right? How about the period test too, right? In here, in the period test value is, let's say you have about 7 over here. That's a quite good value. However, your insertion torque is over here can be 7 or 6 or can be about 15. 
So again, period test also showing that even though you have a high period test value, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a high torque, right? So let me share my simple video clip for our understanding, okay? I play the screw on my the plate, right, with my bare hand. I make the hole and then I put the screw with my bare hand. As you can see, there is no driver is going to be less than maybe 10 Newton centimeter, but I do my best, right? And then I, with my bare hand, I bring back torque as much as possible. And I'm measuring that the implant stability with any check. Now, this machine basically measure the lateral stability, lateral movement. As you can see, those screws is not moving. That's why it has a quite high value of the 67 ISD. That means this implant is not moving laterally, right? You can tell you. And also at the same time, high torque does not necessarily guarantee higher, high lateral stability. So it is very important for us to understand that measuring stability, we have to measure the two things. First one is torque, and the other one is lateral or vertical stability. In other words, mobility over here, right? Keep in mind, right? So suggest so the minimum value requirement for the immediate loading, if you're using the any check, then I recommend minimum about 20 to 30 Newton centimeter end, and then any check minimum is 60 and 65 ISD. Then why I make those range, 60 and 65, right? That means when you do the measure the lateral movement, lateral mobility of those implants, it depends on the location of the implant. If you place the implant in the lateral area, maxillary lateral, the bone itself is flexible over there. So when you measure the lateral mobility, actually whole bone can be give you a little bit of the uh, first negative one. That's why it depends on where you're going to measure, you're going to change your minimum value a little bit then keep in mind, it is end, right? So you have to have an implant that has a more than 20 Newton centimeter insertion torque and any check value is more than 60 ISD, then I can say that was a quite minimum requirement for the immediate loading, right? How about the conventional loading? You didn't place the implant, somebody else placed the implant and then you saw this patient, but you're not so sure whether this implant is ready or not. In that case, I strongly recommend you to using the reverse torque, right? Reverse torque, I, I want you to apply 15 Newton centimeter, no more than that, okay? No less than that. You apply the 15 Newton centimeter and then see if it's moving or not, right? You may worry about applying the reverse torque and then you're going to compromise those implants. However, 15 Newton centimeter is not really high numbers, right? If after three or four months later, your implant is moved back or reverse torque with a 15 Newton, that means something wrong with that implant. You don't want to put any crown on top of it. So apply those reverse torque is 15 Newton, make sure your fixture is not moving, and then you can use any check and measure those IST value. If that is more than 60, then I can say that is quite stable, and then you can move on over here. So keep in mind, this is end. So overall, let's look at, at this time in the market, there's available any check, Oster, period test, and torque wrenches. When we look at the torque, any check cannot measure it, Oster cannot measure it, period test cannot measure it. You have to measure the torque separately with your torque wrenches. In terms of lateral mobility, any check can measure it, Oster cannot measure it, period test measure it, torque cannot measure it. Bone graft effect, once you place the bone graft, any check will not be affected. However, Oster going to have a first positive one, period test no effect, torque wrench is no effect. Patient comfort, any check is acceptable. It's not, patient will not be really happy, however, it's acceptable. But when we look at the Oster, if you look at the, think about the procedures, patient come to your clinic, you have to remove the healing abutment and then put the smart peg and then measure it and remove the smart peg and then put the healing button back, right? It is a quite a burden and then patient doesn't like it. And perio test, as I told you before, it is terrible, patient hate it, and talk rest is acceptable. How about the extra cost? Any check, since you measure the stability using existing healing abutment, you don't have to pay anything. However, also in each patient, you have to buy and then place the, the smart peg, right? 
and then period test and then talk is no money needed. In terms of doctor's convenience, um, excellent any check is quite easy because you just holding and pushing it only the two times or six times. But also, as I told you before, changing those uh, healing abutment and smart peg is a big issue. Period test is a really big issue. Talk range is acceptable. If I look at all those four the aspect, and then if you want to buy a, a implant stability measuring device, and then I strongly recommend we have a, enough reason why you want to choose the NHF. But more important thing is this. My take home message is talk, right? Without the talk, right? The lateral uh, stability is not uh, meaningful. Without the lateral the stability numbers, the torque itself is not also meaningful. So both need to go together, right? That is my type of message. Now, let me give you some suggested insertion torque. If you're doing the two stage, so in other words, you're going to do the primary closure, then your minimum torque going to be five Newton centimeters. Yeah, that is totally depend on your clinical preference, but less than five Newton centimeter, really bad. About 10 Newton centimeter, you can try it. But if you're doing the one stage implant, that means you're going to put the healing abutment right after surgery, then your minimum, the torque should be 15 Newton centimeters, right? And also the most important thing that I want to point out is please place the healing abutment as short as possible. So I, as, uh, I recommend about two millimeter above the gingival line is what you want. Do not put five or six millimeter above the gingival line. If you have a high profile of the healing abutment, patient begin to touch with their tongue and many times they chew. Maybe some of you already experienced that patient chew the food very well with their healing abutment, right? And also one thing that is occlusion. Again, if you have, uh, let's say patient has no posterior tooth, but you have only one molar that you put implant and you put the that for, maxillary first molar with the healing abutment, then definitely patient gonna chew on this side. So please be careful, right? So in terms of those the occlusion, whether your healing abutment gonna be used for the chewing or not, that is something you have to be very careful. In terms of the immediate loading case, and then my recommendation is minimum is 20 Newton centimeter and other stability values, right? So 20, 20 Newton centimeter plus any check that is about 60 IST or 65 IST, also, you can use uh, um, ISQ value, 60, 65 ISQ, that is also uh, okay. And then also after the healing period, right, then what I recommend again, using the reverse torque 15 Newton centimeter test, right? So apply the 15 Newton. However, some of my friends apply the 15 Newton centimeter reverse torque quite a long time, don't do that. Just apply a little bit and then make sure that it's not moving, right? You don't want to hold, keep applying those 15 Newton reverse torque for a long time, right? And then one thing that I want to point out is avoid the pre-tapping with the fixture. It means many doctors, many of my friends, when they place the implant, once they experience high torque, and then they put the implant, go back, and then apply the counter torque, uh, turning back two or three times, back and forth, back and forth. And then also, and then they claim that they going, they did the tapping of those um, bones. So eventually their final torque, insertion torque is about 40 Newton, right? Even though they start about 70 Newton centimeters, right? That, I call that is a fixture tapping, but actually that is not tapping. Tapping means that you cut the bone and then you create the space. However, if you do the back and forth with your fixture, then basically you are temporarily expand the bone, right? Once your bone is expanded, then once you place the implant, our bone go back to the normal dimension. And then all those the, uh, compression going to be again on the implant's the bone surface. And then your uh, bone and your bone have a higher chance to get some compression necrosis or rapid bone modeling. So, Again, do not use your fixture for the tapping. If you experience a high torque, then remove that the fixture and then do the tapping while proper osteotomy is done and then place the implant. That is one thing that I want to point out. And then some consideration for the resonant frequency analysis value evaluation. First, as I told you before, vertical defect of the bone pattern. 
if you have uh, those uh, vertical buckle wall is gone, right? Very low, no stability bus tip, it's gonna give you a first pass tip. And then if you put some bone graft, if you need to put some bone graft and make sure you measure the RFA value before the bone graft. After the bone graft, the number gonna be changed. And also because of the RFA value can be changed, influenced by the bone defect pattern, so to have a definitive stability evaluation, I recommend to using the CBC study. So make sure there is no vertical bony defect and you are uh, on the good shape. And also I highly recommend for this machine for the long-term pattern study. In other words, if you measure the oyster machine each month, right, then it going to, and then you have like six months or five months series of the value, it is a great number and then great data for you to see how your implant uh, also orientation and the OC integration and stability is changed. That's, so you can appreciate the pattern. However, without those uh, timeline, just a one time a snapshot that you measure those implants, it gives you 65 on that time without knowing the history, then that value is uh, quite uh, unreliable, keep in mind, because of the possible bony defect, right? Pretty much this is what I prepared for you guys. And then uh, let me uh, look at what we have as your as your questions. Okay. So the first question is this: Can we check check torque 15 newton centimeter when we unscrew healing, or do we have to put torque wrench directly on the implant? Right. So when we apply the reverse torque, reverse torque on the healing abutment then usually healing abutment is unscrewed, right? Before you reach the 15 Newton centimeters, right? So in that case, you cannot measure it. However, you apply the 20 Newton, 30 Newton, then it unscrewed, then you know that, that your implant has a more than uh, 15 Newton centimeter reverse torque. A bottom line is this, uh, in this case, to measure the reverse torque, anyway, you need to get the, the uh, impression coping all those others. So I want you to remove the healing abutment and then put the driver back and then apply the 15 Newton centimeters, right? And then check those reverse torque, right? There's a better way and the more safe way, right? Okay, so then we have uh, any other question regarding those stability? Yes, Dr. Park, so you already you answered all the questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think um, you already answered all of the questions. Um, and now um, I, I think we already answered uh, all the questions. And if you, you have any additional questions, you can also um, email to uh, Dr. Park. Um, if you have any further questions. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Park, for your presentation. And um, I want to move on to uh, announcements. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Park, again. So if you are interested in taking our webinars, you can find upcoming webinars in our website at www.neobiotechusa.com and simply click on this webinar at the top, then you'll be on our webinar page. And starting on May, we will have a two webinars every Monday and Thursday. So total, we have four webinars weekly. And the time is one in the morning from 11 to 12 and the one in the afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific Coast time. And just want to mention that all these courses are first come, first served basis. So please register in advance and reserve your spot. And we also have a great lecture coming up next week on Monday with Dr. Kent Kwong on sinus lift at 2 p.m. and also with Dr. Lara on implant complication and failure. And on Thursday, at 11 a.m. with Dr. Owen Train on anterior implant, and lastly on May 14 with Dr. Jeff Jeffrey Platt on advanced bone grafting. So we also have more webinars coming up. Uh, we also added on our website. So I 
Um, so the first one is the, on May 18 with Dr. Ken Huang for the, um, it's the basic implant dentistry part one. And then the part two will be on May 21st. And the next one is with Dr. Mark Chen on uh, fundamental of bridge splitting on Monday, May 18 at 11. And then the next one is on Thursday, May 21st with Dr. Owen Trent on all on X and also with Dr. Dennis Smiler on May 25th on part one. It's on planning and surgery for a trim accelerator zygma. And then the part two will be on May 28th. And lastly, on May 28th, Thursday, on topic of fundamental of bridge augmentation with GBR with Dr. Mike Chen. So please check out our webinar page and please register. And now you can watch our previous webinars on our website. Just click on there's a previous webinar uh, at the top and you are um, feel free to watch our webinars here in our website. Here is our website. And thank you very much for those who stay until the end. And as part of our ongoing effort to provide better continuing education courses, we would like to need your feedback. So one of our sales rep will email you this link to complete. And this form should no longer take that five minutes. It's very easy. And the form should look like this. And there's more questions. So please, once you receive it, Submit it as soon as possible because we will provide C open completion of this course evaluation. And here is the um, it's it's good for today. So I really want to thank you for those who stayed until the end and rejoined those of you also rejoined for um, second webinar. And we truly appreciate your time. And I think it is a good time for um, gaining some knowledge and get educated um, during this time. So um, if you're interested and uh, you can find this and you check on our website and um, you here here it is the promo code so the promo code for this one is the park 0507 um this is the promo code and um if you see on this one if you know your sales rep please um write uh, write his or her name if you don't know um you can just skip to it and i want to say thank you again for participating in today's webinar and we hope to see you again next time. And feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Here's my email, ayong.chui at neobiotechusa.com. And I truly appreciate your time. And thank you, Dr. Park, again for your time as well. <laughs> thank you for being here and thank you for your presentation. I thank you, everybody. And I wish everybody stay healthy and then happy. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. And I also have, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.